Anybody need a Bible? Bible, anybody? You got Mars, got hers? Anybody? Anybody need a Bible? We're reading the ESV. And we're in Philippians. And I'm right in front of your face, for those of you who haven't been here in a, in a little while. I kind of like this, you know, so I, you guys have started to back up the past few weeks. Yeah. It's all right. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't take offense. Yeah. Nobody wants to get wet. We should start selling the, uh, or giving away the little ponchos. So yeah, we're in Philippians 4. And like they said, next week I'm going to be in Guatemala. I was doing my best to not miss a Sunday, but Spirit Airlines does not, they only do Fridays and Mondays. So I had to be there for five days. So keep it in prayer. But we do have a very special service lined up. Pastor Art Dykstra is going to be here. He's a very cultured guy, been around the world. He's a pilot, you know. Uh, what else does he do? He, Wes was his intern for like a year, so he knows Wes really well. So make sure if you can make it back that you give them a warm welcome. And also the leading worship next, next week is a guy named Kelly Nunn and his band. He's a professional uh, artist, and he's worked with Under Oath and different bands, so he's not going to like be screaming. So, But it's going to be good worship. I'm definitely excited about that. But um, we're, today we're finishing up the series in Philippians, and I don't know about you guys, but I've been very challenged and blessed by the series. Today we're taking a look at the last few verses, and, and we're actually going to be starting 1 Corinthians. Pastor Art, next week, he's going to go into Acts 18 and look at when the churches were planted in Corinth, and he's going to do a little bit of an overview of Corinthians. And then when I get back, we're going to start the series called City Culture Life. That's what we're going to call it, City Culture and Life. And I'm just really excited about what God wants to do through that series. And um, I was mentioning to some people this morning just about, you know, kind of the, a vision that I think we have for our church and um, about the possibility of getting one little office space somewhere near downtown that could be used um, specifically for, you know, contributing to reaching our city. But we're going to, right now, Wes is in my office at Mangrove. So uh, he's going to use that for his office, or the church office. And um, we're probably going to use that for our Wednesday night service. So keep that in prayer. It's something we want to do is find a little office space, about a thousand square feet, something somewhere, maybe near downtown area. So keep that in prayer. And hopefully, I think, it seems like it's a perfect fit for the next series that we're going through uh, in Corinthians. So it's going to be exciting and um, yeah, we'll see what the Lord does with that. But um, two weeks ago, we mentioned, some of you guys weren't here, but that we did a series, a sermon called Church Life. And it was that time we were in Philippians where Syntyche and Euodia, they were arguing with one another. And we really looked at the church in Philippi, and we laid out really how our church functions uh, in, here at Calvary 813. And and on that week, I brought forth a name as um, a name to be a, an elder if no dirt comes up on, it, on him, you know, for the next few weeks. So, and, and I did kind of lay out what an elder looks like for our church, and it's a little bit different than a pastor um, just here. They help with shepherding. Um, there's really two things that the elder does. They, one, they help shepherd, and two, they are an example. And that's based on 1 Peter 5.3. It says that the, the elders are to be willing, you know, they're to help shepherd the flock, and they are to be an example. So th that name was Wes Baird, and we, unfortunately, there was tons of dirt that came in on him, and we couldn't, no, I'm just kidding. No, no dirt came in on Wes, and his parents are here, so I'm going to mess with him a little bit. So um, we're going to lay hands on Wes uh, this morning. I'm excited for that. But real quick, I just wanted to, before he comes up here, um, we do that based on the fact that he's a qualified man. If you look in 1 Timothy chapter 3, um, in Titus 1, it lays out a whole list of things, you know, one being that he manages his family well, that he's a one-woman man, that, you know, a man of one wife, that he's res uh, respectable, that he has a good reputation or some of, the th some of the things. But we, you know, that's what we're looking for in people who are elders at this church. Um, and I definitely hope within the next several months to, to possibly ordain one or more or possibly two more. And, um, but really, we just do that for a person who's doing the work. The person who's 
already helping shepherd and a person who is already being an example, a person who is a qualified man. And, and Wes has been doing that. He has been helping me shepherd tremendously behind the scenes. You know, he's, um, to the best of our knowledge, a qualified person to do that. And all we're doing today is just putting a title on him and the work that he's already doing. And uh, we will pray for him. And um, so Wes, why don't you go ahead and come up here. And the, our biggest downfall with Wes is he's, is he's young, you know. But he's not a recent convert. You know, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon was actually 19 when he took over the pastorate uh, in London. So Wes is at least a year older than that. So <laughs> I think, no, he's like 24, I think. But actually, can um, Will, would you want to come up here? Christian, Mark, a couple of the guys, come on up here. We're going to lay hands on Wes and pray for him. Will's a elder at Calvary in St. Pete. Um, but yeah, we're going to lay hands on him. Steve, you want to come up here? Steve? And we're just going to pray for Wes and pray that God would um, bless him. Here, somebody else lay some hands on. Smack him around a little bit. <laughs> Lord, we just come before you this morning. We're just excited, Lord, for what you're doing in our fellowship. And we're thankful for Wes, that you've brought him here, that he's been helping shepherd, Lord, that he's been an example to us of, of how to live by faith and walk with you. And Lord, we're just excited for what you're going to do through him in the future, through his ministry. And Lord, we just pray that your anointing would rest upon Wes, that he would be able to do everything that you've called him to do as, a, as an elder, Lord. And we, we look forward to what you're going to do through him in the future. So God, we just ask for your anointing to be upon his life. Pray you continue to help him to walk by faith and to lead his family well and to uh, be a qualified man, Lord. And we just lift him up to you and we lay him at your feet this morning, Lord, and, and are just thankful for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Our boy Wes. He's out, man. My water's gone. Anyways, I'll just start drinking the, the grape juice. So the sermon series today, last week a lot of us, I, including myself, were really blessed by the, the, the message of the word of Philippians and really dealing with anxiety and um, just the pressures that we feel inside our hearts and inside our minds. And we really looked at how to deal with that, how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with, you know, struggles of, in our heads, you know, when we feel messed up in our head or in our hearts. And today, really, there's one more piece added on to that. You know, last week we said the three things we gave to practice um, was one was rejoice in the Lord. You know, the... In, I don't know about you, but I've been trying to do that. I've been practicing that. You know, the other one was pray with thanksgiving, just straight from the Bible. This is, you know, this is a clear thing that God gives us to practice, to pray with thanksgiving. And the other one was to change our thinking, you know, to think about things that are, you know, good, things that are noble. You know, we saw that Paul, he thought about what God was doing in his life, and he was able to handle the anxiety, the pressure. Um, that, that he was going through. He was able to deal with that practically with some things that God gave us. And I don't know about you, but I've, you know, I've personally, I've been dealing with this. I, I confessed last week that I've, you know, really been a, an angry jerk. To, you know, I tend to be an angry jerk, you know, unreasonable. And that's what that, the opposite of that is. It says, don't be anxious, but be reasonable. And when we were looking at anxiety and what that does, because we try and control and hang on to the future, and because we're anxious about things that are coming, that it tends to result and manifest itself in being angry or being, you know, slashing out sometimes, you know, to people. You know, and I've honestly, I've been doing better. This week, I think I only fired twice, Wes twice, you know? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Only once, I think. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but I've definitely been doing better, you know, um, even around the house, you know, I've blown it. I've definitely blown it a few times. I'm sure all of us deal with that. Um, but, but, but that's something that God is able to help us do. And today, he's sort of adding on one more piece. You know, Paul being this mature Christian, he's adding on this piece of contentment. And that's really the title of the message today is just craving contentment. It sounds kind of funny, but it's kind of the opposite. You know, we crave things, and, but we're supposed to be content. And if you think about emotional pain, you know, there's really three categories that, that cause emotional pain. 
we've dealt with identity. One of them is identity. You know, th when we don't know who we are as a person, a lot of times that causes, it causes us to be a mess. And we did a part of a message on our, that our identity is in Christ. That's who we are, that we are in Christ. And the next piece to the, what causes emotional pain really is what we looked at last week, needing to have control of everything. You guys follow me on that? And the third piece really to that is desire, or you can say like craving something, or really the opposite of contentment. So there's this piece of content, this thing called contentment, being satisfied is the state of inner satisfaction of the situation, the surrounding that we're in, that God wants to, us to be able to have, and that Paul actually said that he has done that, that he's learned the secret, as we'll read in just a second. Um, but he's done that. He's learned the secret of being content. So let's read here in Philippians, amazing text, Philippians, as we've, we're going to finish out the book today, but Philippians 4 and verse 10. It says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance and need. Did you guys f catch that? Verse 12. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Probably one of the most verses taken out of context most often, but it's interesting there. It's talking about being content. And then he says, I can do all things, or some scriptures say everything. Some uh, translations say everything. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's read the next set of verses here. Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. Verse 15, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. That's interesting verse. We, when we give sacrificially, it's to our account that's in heaven. And I'm not going to go off on that, which we could, but we're not going to do that today. Uh, verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrificial or sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you, and all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. So if Paul's content, he's without the resources that he needs. And the church is able to share resources with him, even though he's not asking for it. You know, the church was able to share with that, share him with that. But anytime there's a secret, I don't know about you, but I want to know the secret. You know, Paul said, I've learned the secret to be content. And I actually Googled, what is the secret to dot, dot, dot? You know, and, I, and you know how Google does that little pop down thing? The first, very first thing on there was, I've learned the secret to life. You know, it's like people are obviously Googling that. You know, or what is the secret to life, I'm sorry. And the next one was, what is the secret to happiness? You know, I think this is really what this is talking about here. The next one, you'd think, what is the secret to Candy Crush? You know, I was like, Teresa? Teresa needs to know that one. She loves that game. But it's interesting. But here today, we have the secret to contentment. And I don't know about you, contentment being this feeling of inner satisfaction, don't we all want that? You know, don't we all chase after satisfaction or contentment? You know, we all want it. I don't know about you, but I want it, that feeling of being satisfied. You know, we naturally want to be satisfied. This past uh, Friday, I had a birthday, and it's like, what do you want to do for your birthday? And I said, I want to go eat sushi. And, you know, 
one of those things that happens when you go eat sushi is like, there's some people that like to just, every, we get one big boat, you know, and we'll all just get a bunch of rolls and we'll all split it. And I'm thinking, you gotta be kidding me. I wanna eat sushi. I'm not gonna be worried about how many pieces, you know. So we went to have all you can eat sushi. Saki's in Clearwater, it was an awesome place. But you know what? I tell you what, when I was done, I even calculated the amount, it was like $30. And I was satisfied <laughs> with sushi. I had enough, man. I was like, I was full, you know? And that's, we all want that. We all want to be full. We want to have satisfaction. And it causes us sometimes to chase after things that we think are gonna satisfy us. You know, marketing just tickles this, you know, thing till we just gotta scratch it, you know? it's like. You know, how many things, it's like that time you're sitting on the couch and it's, you're just hungry and what comes on? You know, Taco Bell, like the cheesy gordita crunch, you know, with its soft outside and the crunchy inside. And, you know, it's like, oh, I gotta have it. I gotta have the cheesy gordita crunch, you know, that's just, you know, whatever it is, the diet, the pants, you know, the, they make you look 20 years younger, you know, they just, they do that. They, that thing is gonna make us satisfied, you know, the undergarments or whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, but we crave, we crave, we have this thing in, in us, naturally. The sinful person has this, these cravings and they mess with our head. They mess with our hearts, they really do. They do, I'm telling you. And you, sometimes we don't even realize it. And the Bible actually says that it turns into it can turn into destructive behavior. Look at um, 1 Timothy 6, 9, or write it down. It says, but those who desire, this is talking about riches, those who crave riches fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Craving the wrong thing, unhealthy cravings, can lead to destructive behavior. Like, what's the first thing that comes to your mind with that? Drugs, doesn't it? What's, what's more destructive than drugs? And who is going to go take drugs? It's the person that's emotionally distraught, is wanting something that they cannot fill. They can't meet that thing. So they go take a drug or they get drunk, and they're not happy unless they're ripped. You know, it's like that's how they find satisfaction is through drinking and through drugs. You know, for us, I don't think, you know, I wouldn't even say that. There's a lot less drug addicts around here than there is the last place I was at. Let me just say that. But uh, good job. You know, the thing <laughs> it makes ministry a lot easier, let me tell you. Uh, but no, work, work, being a workaholic, that's destructive behavior. And that's naturally this thing that can happen if we're striving and craving and we think that the certain level of income is going to satisfy us or the certain title at work is going to satisfy us, we can become workaholics. And I'm by no means saying that we're to be lazy, um, but we're just to, to be content with what God's given us. So what is the secret? Uh, what is the secret? It's the divine power for strength. It says it straight up. Uh, verse 13, right? I can do all things through Christ. It's divine, divine power. It says that divine, through God's strength that we can actually be content in whatever the circumstance, any kind of situation. Paul is in the situation where he is without the resources that he needs to even eat. You know, he's without, he's chained to a prisoner in a Philippian jail, and he's without all those resources. And he's going to say at that point, he's learned the secret of being content. And thinking through this thing, it's like, again, we're not sitting in prison. We're not, we're not sitting there chained to a wall, you know, but we have our own prisons. We really do. We have these things, these feelings that just come upon us where it's just like, get me out of this situation. You know, it's just like everything in you, it's almost like you're just, there's times where we just don't want to be where we're at when we're there. You know, whether it's the house we're in, whether it's the task that we're called to do at work. I mean, do you guys feel that? There's things that we're going through. We don't want to be there. And God's saying, you can be content. You can make it through this, through God's strength, through God's divine power. He's able to help you through this situation. So there's a couple of things I, I just threw together for that. 
And the first one is that this divine strength, it has to, number one, it has to help us accept God's will. And Paul obviously came to this place where he's sitting there and he's accepted the fact that God's will for him is to be in this prison. It's, he's there, he's struggling with the situation, he's got this thing going on, and, it, and he has found the secret through Christ, is able to give him strength while he's there. It's tough physically, it's tough spiritually, and he has no idea that 2,000 years later we're going to be looking back and just gl almost glorifying Paul because he was able to do that. How did Paul, at the situation that he was in, it was horrible. But yet he's able to find strength through Christ. And look at the legacy that he left behind. You know, look, look at what God, you know, has used him for because he was able to find contentment through that situation. So God's able to do that to help us to accept his will for us. But we have to look to him. And, and at, at the end of the service, we're going to do that. We're going to pray for God's power, for his presence to help us and for him, his spirit to help us through those things. But Paul actually asked, maybe you've read, Paul asked for God to take away many different things. One thing, it says that there was a thorn in his flesh. We're not sure, may, maybe it was a sickness, maybe it was um, something he was struggling with, but there was a thorn and that Paul prayed over and over that God would take that from him. But yet God said about that one thing, he said, hey, my grace is made sufficient, or my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So there's these times that we're going to feel extremely weak, that God wants to give us the power so that we glorify his name. You know, when we are weak, he is strong. So when, you, when you're in those place of feeling weak, you have to personally cry out to God and get, let him help you with uh, the strength to get through what you're going through. So by God's power, you can be content with what God's doing in your life, even in weakness. The second thing there is that God's going to give us the divine power to trust in God's provision. That's in our text. It's, it's specifically what Paul was going through, and I, I know it's specifically what we deal with many times. Some of us deal with the pressure of not knowing when our bills are going to be paid. We're not going to be, we're not sure if we're going to make it to the next month. You know, we have to deal with trusting that God will provide. There's amazing scriptures in the, the word. Matthew uh, 6, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, but seek first God's kingdom and God will provide. We have to learn to trust, trust that God's going to provide. That, that verse we just read, God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So I will say there is a connection there. I have to just throw this out there. There's a connection with God providing and us giving. There really is. There's definitely both of those scriptures say, seek first God's kingdom. Give your time to God and God will provide. You know, that's the same with us as a church. It's for us personally. When we learn to just honor God, like, um, there's, so, there's t tons of scriptures. Proverbs 3, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your tithe, then your vats will be overflowing. And that's just this natural thing that happens. I mean, God's going to provide, even if you are greedy and stingy, <laughs> he will. You know, but he'll probably test us and teach us more. But God wants us to give, and then he will provide. Um, Ma Malachi 3.10 says, bring the tithe into the storehouse, um, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. It's the only time God says, test me. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be a room enough to store it. I don't like talking about this topic. I'm just telling you, that's in the text. If you give, God's going to supply your needs. And it's, yeah, you guys follow me. You got that. I don't know why. You guys are awesome. Our bills are paid. We pay for everything here, cash. Great job, guys. You guys are great at giving the tithe. Praise the Lord for you guys. You know. Um, then the third one, so you can trust in him. Got a little messed up there. But we serve a big God, don't we? He's bigger than our financial problems. He's bigger than any kind of situation that we're in. We can trust in God. God is able to provide. You know, God speaks and creates life. You know, the fact that he hasn't just given you more is probably more to do with your own heart than it is anything. 
you know, verse after verse, you know, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, it's everything is God's. You know, and he gives us finances. And a lot of times he teaches us lessons through that. You know, but God's, we serve a big God. You know, in Tozer, he says you got to have the right view of God. If you, you know, if your God's not a big God, you're not going to pray big things, you know, but if God's a tiny little God to you, you know, but we have a big God that's able to provide when we need it. He's able to help us. He's able to be there. The third thing here is that God's strength or God's power helps us to find satisfaction in him. And that's similar to some of the things we were talking about last week, but but we're able to find satisfaction in him. There's times at work that are com- going to be completely unfulfilling, you know, where we're able uh, to find satisfaction in him. You, you'll be doing this thing. It's like, really? I'm doing this? You know, no, God's going to help you through. There's days where you're sick of being in Florida. I know I have that. You know, it's just like hot, and you leave your Bible on the dashboard, and it like rolls up into a little ball because it's so hot. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, I don't want to be here. I'm done with Florida, you know. But there's times that we find satisfaction in him when it's blistering hot outside, you know. Um, but material things will never satisfy us. The, we can have, you know, the perfect husband will never satisfy us. The perfect wife will never satisfy us. The perfect job will not satisfy you. The perfect retirement income is not going to satisfy you. God is what satisfies us. God is the perfect spouse. God gives us the perfect work to do. You know, God gives us, you know, the perfect retirement plan, doesn't he? He's preparing for us the perfect retirement for all creation, and God satisfies. You know, last week, um, Psalm 23 was on some of our hearts, you know, and, and just think about the picture of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. You know, he leads me by quiet waters, by still waters. You know, he restores my soul. It's him that the sheep is satisfied in. It's God. God is our shepherd. We're the sheep, and he's going to lead us to peaceful waters in our soul. You know, he's the one that's going to do that in our minds and in our soul. You know, and he's able to take us to that place, you know, because he's the shepherd. You may remember the story of John chapter 4. Jesus walks up to the, the woman at the well, and he's talking to this lady, and, he's, and all of his disciples are like, why are you talking to that lady? You know, like, she's a prostitute, you know, it's like, but this lady he's talking to, they're talking, and it's like, Jesus is like, you've had five husbands, you know, and he's, he says, he basically comes to her, and he says, if you come to me, you'll never thirst again, is what he says. Come to Jesus, and we will never thirst again. Again, that's an amazing promise, isn't it? That God's going to satisfy that thirst that we have for all things in, the, in our soul that we can be quenched by God and by his spirit. There's living waters for us to drink of. And God wants to satisfy our soul deep within. And it's, it's only by his power. We can do this through Christ who gives us strength. We can do everything. Specifically, we can be content with everything, you know, that God calls us to. That definitely speaks to, we can do everything that God's called us to. If God's called you to speak, you can do it through Christ's strength. If God's called you to move, God, you can do it through Christ's strength. If God's called you to do some crazy thing at work, some difficult thing where it's, there's all this pressure, you can do that through Christ's strength. But you definitely could be content through Christ's strength as well. That's specifically what this is saying. You can have rest within your soul, you know, because of God's strength. One thing that God's teach me to help me with this, this particular thing, is really what he did, what God did uh, in creation. You know, for a good practice, a good ritual, if you want to call it that, to do is think about God. Day one, work. You know, day two, created this. Day three, created this. And on the seventh day, he did what? You thought I was going to say rest. He did rest, but he also looked at it and he said, this is good. This is good. Creation is good. What I've just done is good. It's a good for us to rest and then reflect on the good things that God has done. He really does. A quote I read um, 
it just says, rituals of celebration and rest after we have worked well are essential for building up the memory bank of contentment and consequently fueling our future contentment. That was a lot of words. But basically, it is something that God does in our souls when we're able to just stop for a minute and reflect on what God has done. I tried to do that on my birthday. You know, I was like, wow, I never expected everything that happened this year. I did not expect it. And it's like, wow, this is good. I like it. You know, it was, hasn't been that great for the seven years before that, but it happened to be pretty good, you know, for the things. And I was able to, to rest and sit there and reflect and think about what God's done. And I encourage each and one of you to, to do that. For me, it's on Monday. It's, it's not on a Sunday. You know, this to me is work. You know, it's like a, it's labor. It's pretty labor intensive to get up here and do this. But God has t- ha- allowed me to take Mondays to take and to go and to reflect and to rest and to Sabbath um, and, to, and to really reflect on what God's done. And it's allowed me to be content. You know, it's helped me to be content. So there's, we have to learn to say well done, if you will, you know, in, in things in our lives. So we're going to take communion in just a, a couple of minutes, but first I just wanted to um, just seek and pray for God's presence. It says in Isaiah 40, it says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. There is power. God wants to give us the power to be able to do what he's called us to do. He, there's power to accept God's will for our lives, even though it may be difficult. There's power to be satisfied in Him, and there's power to trust in Him. But every one of us, don't miss this, every one of us has to ask for it personally. The power's there for those who ask for it. You know, God wants for you to humble yourself and to ask Him for His presence to help you You know, when you feel like you can't do any more, you know, God wants to help you do it. He wants to give you the strength you need to make it through whatever it is. But you have to ask personally. And I just want to take a few minutes in prayer um, and pray that God would give you that. And I just ask that you would agree with me in your own heart that God would give you the strength and the power that you need to be content or to to be able to do whatever it is he's called you to do. So let's pray and then... um, Let me just pray for you guys and pray for God's presence and power upon your life. God, we come before you and just thinking through this text, Lord, it's it's amazing that Paul was able to learn to be content in that circumstance. And that's my prayer this morning for every person that's here, that they would be able to have the strength from heaven to deal with the the situation that they're in, Lord. And I just pray, and we all pray as a church this morning for your strength, for your power, Lord, to be upon our lives, to to be able to accept what your will is for us, and to be able to trust in you. Lord, we trust that you're a big God. We trust that you're able to provide. We trust that, Lord, that you're able to satisfy us deeply and give us that inner peace and joy that we have, that that only you can give, Lord. God, we ask you, we ask you to to fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to to come upon us, Lord, in power to be able to deal with the situations and the circumstances that we are in personally. Lord, we love you. We praise you, God. I just pray for every person here that your power would be upon them right this moment, this week. Lord, as we looked last week, Your joy, your peace, Lord, is there for us. You want us to be a people that experience the joy of the Lord. You want us to have peace within our souls, Lord, that that other people just don't understand, Lord. And in a terrible circumstance, Lord, I pray that you give every one of us that peace and that joy and that contentment where, like last week we prayed, that we can say, it is well with my soul. I'm not a mess anymore. It's well with my soul because the peace of God, because the joy of the Lord is upon me. God, we pray for that. I pray for that for every person here, Lord, that you would just, by your spirit, just bless and give strength today, Lord. Minister, continue to minister by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Um, the last verse in Philippians says, if you look at it, we're almost, we're going to have five more minutes. We're going to take communion. Hang with me. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. In just a minute, we're going to take communion. And the grace of the Lord Jesus is upon us. The grace is, the, is what God gives us that we do not deserve. You guys follow me on that? God has given us something that we absolutely do not deserve. And what is that? It's salvation. God's given us salvation. You know, for by grace you have been saved. This is not of ourselves. It's nothing we've earned. It's what God's given us that we have not earned. It's salvation through Jesus Christ. Isaiah says that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus lived the perfect life that we could not have lived. Jesus died the death that we should have died. And he is, because of that, he substituted himself. He's paid the price for our sins. And because of that sacrifice, and that sacrifice alone, we could be saved because of what Jesus did for us. He walked, he lived the perfect life when we couldn't. You know, he's given us out salvation by faith in Jesus. If you believe that Jesus did that for you, that he was buried for your, that he died, that he was buried for your sins, you believe that he rose again, then you're saved. If you believe that and you trust in that sacrifice, then your sins are taken away. Your sin is what separates for you from God. It's what separates us from God. And the only way for that to be taken away is through Jesus Christ, that sacrifice. And this morning when we take communion, we walk up here, that's what we're doing. We're proclaiming that, proclaiming that death until Jesus comes again. You know, that's all we're doing. It's just a symbol, you know, saying, I believe. I believe that Jesus' body was crushed. I believe that the blood was shed on my behalf. And it's for us. It's salvation. We're just saying we believe it. You know, we're confessing it openly and publicly. So I just invite you this morning, maybe you've never taken communion. Maybe this is your first time. All you're going to do is you're going to take the piece of bread, you're going to dip it in the blood, and then whenever you're ready, you know, just, just eat it. And, and just think about Jesus. Think about what Christ has done for you. So let's all do this, and then we're going we're gonna to sing one more song, and just come forward and dip the bread and take your juice, and I'll get out of the way. <laughs>